you're listening to The Primal Happiness Show, a podcast dedicated to helping you thrive in this crazy modern world. Every Tuesday, we explore the nature of how our minds really work, what exactly the human animal requires to thrive, and how we can live happier and more fulfilling lives. If you're new here and haven't yet taken our free class, then there's no better place to get a jump start on reclaiming your primal happiness. It's where we'll guide you step-by-step through our antidote to today's modern world. Simply head on over to primalhappiness.co slash antidote to get the free class and discover how to thrive without having to move to a planet that's not so crazy as ours. But now, your host, Leanne Brooks Tyler. Hello, my beautiful people. A huge warm welcome back to the show. In today's crazy modern world, men and women are living shallow, disconnected, and unfulfilling lives. So we created the path for those who are ready to reclaim their wildness and actualize their deepest gifts. And the next way you can walk that path is by joining Waking the Wild Feminine or Waking the Wild Masculine coming this September. September. They are potent circles to support you in discovering your soul path, expressing your heart's truth and rising into sovereignty, all whilst being fully seen and held by a circle of your fellow men or women. It is incredibly powerful, activating magic. Go along to primalhappiness.co slash WTWF for Wake and Wild Feminine, which is now open for enrolment, or primalhappiness.co slash WTWM for Wake and Wild Masculine to discover more and register your interest to be the first to get a chance to enrol when it opens very soon. The spaces for both of those are intentionally limited to create the most intimate and powerful experience possible. And they do fill up fast. So if you are feeling it's for you, take action now to be sure of your place. And now onto this week's show. It's with Aidan Wachter. Aidan is back on the show for, I think it's the second time. (laughs) Aidan has been involved in practical magic since the 1980s. He's an animist and is deeply concerned with the effects of the modern Western life ways on the human animal on both physical and spiritual levels. Aidan views a living magical practice as a path to heal many of the problems we face today and a way of being that's intrinsic to the creatures that we are. He's the author of Six Ways and Weaving Fate both excellent books and I can recommend both of them highly. In this show, we explored what magic is and how to begin your own magical practice. It really is such a brilliant introduction to listeners who are new to real magic, but those who already have a practice will likely hear something fresh in this conversation just because Aidan does bring such a fresh and real approach to this topic. Absolutely loved this episode. Aidan delivered just beautifully as ever. Let's dive in. Hello, Aidan. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you for having me again, Leanne. Oh, I can't wait. What, what a gorgeous conversation. I'm quite happy to spend all the time in the world talking about magic. Absolutely. No, it was really nice chatting with you last time. Uh, I was thinking about uh, that conversation this morning quite a bit. So, uh, Though my memory is hazy because my memory is not the best, but uh, <laughs> I remember yeah, it was a... quite a lot. I was just um, pondering it too before we started talking. And if anyone's listening to this now and hasn't listened to the last show, go listen to that first because it really did set a wonderful foundation in terms of the understanding of rewilding and magic. And I think initially I was saying to you, I was sort of seeing them more and more as two sides of the the same coin. And then as our conversation developed, it was almost like, yeah, even the two sides of the same coin feels like there's too much separation and they're kind of like the same thing (laughs) in some ways. Right. And that's what I, and that's, and that's the, Mm. something that I think I brought up in that conversation is that's the idea that I have, which is, uh, I, I talk about it being one stone, right? Yeah. And there's lots of things that I use this description for. But I think that for me, in the way that I approach magic, it's very much that with rewilding. Uh, mm. It's not. It's all. It's all interrelated. Yeah. Uh, at least as I do it, this is certainly not. I think how necessarily how the mainstream approaches it. No, and that's what really drew me to you and your work. I felt that there was something 
so um, refreshing and but at the same time felt very kind of first principles it felt like it really went to the roots of how i and not even intellectually but just how i experience mar- magic and i think it also goes back and we spoke about this last time it really goes back to the roots of magic which of course are sh- shamanism which is again right. you know like you can't really separate I mean, even rewilding doesn't make sense because it's the wild then at that point when we're talking about shamanism. (laughs) Right. Yeah. So we really spent the entire episode last time exploring that rather than magic itself, just this understanding of the two things being one stone. I love that description. And then we thought today we would much more focus on magic itself. But again, through that frame, which is something, the whole idea of rewilding is a topic we speak about all the time on this show. So that part of it is like, we've now set this, this like it's one stone. So now let's talk about that, this aspect of the stone being magic. And if it's okay with you, going on the idea that, you know, there's a million and one definitions of magic, what's yours? <laughs> which I've contributed about 15 to. Um, <laughs> I don't have a singular definition of magic at all. Um, I find that everything is context dependent. Mm. And so magic itself and how you would define it to me is context dependent. Um, my favorite of them currently is the one that kind of founded kind of a lot of the idea stream of it is in my first book, Six Ways, which is that magic is the art of falling in love with the field and its inhabitants. Mm. And I define the field as all of manifest and unmanifest reality. So the whole thing. And so to me, it's that quality of the relationship more than the specific shape that it mm. takes. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So in that instance, in a way that magic is the relationship, would you say? Right. Mm. Right. There's a thing I said, there was somebody was asking on Twitter um, for kind of how magicians takes on the new age movement. Mm -hmm. And you have people that are like, it's, you know, it's watered down magic or it's too all airy positive or it's too whatever this. And my response was along the lines of saying, I don't think that that's really the, question that what matters is the connection to the field and how we work with that and the style or the approach that we take to do that is going to be very different from person to person and the style is way less important than that connection and Mm. that intentionality of working with it yeah oh I love that yeah that really makes sense so let's spend a little bit of time perhaps exploring this idea and I love that word you use the field and the way that includes manifest and yet to be manifest, let's say, um, reality. How, hmm, this is like one of those like, wow, what a big question. <laughs> <laughs> Just say some more on that, please, Aidan. <laughs> well, to me, what we have is a, a really non-clear understanding of what kind of a, uh, existence we're having. This is my take. I'm not uh, at all. I think science is an awesome thing and brings us awesome tools, but it's very clear that what it teaches us changes over time. Mm -hmm. Um, A friend of mine who was a kind of very high level mathematical scientist, um, he said the thing that he discovered was that the deeper you looked, the more you found. Mm -hmm. And he was literally, he was being really literal about that. Mm -hmm. And so his question was like, is the, are the things that he was seeing there because he was looking right Mm -hmm. and not that he was the creator of it but it's like okay if you want to keep going in this direction there's way more there Mm -hmm. Uh, and i think that magic in my mind kind of views the world that way so i have an experience that i started in magic thinking it was a very reasonable approach to the world but not really liking the forms that i'd found it in Mm. until i found kind of the more shamanic I love that. A very reasonable approach to the world. <laughs> That's really not how most people would describe it. <laughs> I love that. Uh, and so I didn't have a, a real, so I went into ceremonial magic and witchcraft and other things, but I really went into them experimentally. Like, okay, mm-hmm. let's go and do this and see what comes. Because um, I believe there's something 
that I am connected to or I'm aware of, but I don't have a, a kind of tool set to actually work with very mm. effectively. Oh, yes. It's, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so when I talk about the field being the whole of manifest and unmanifest reality, obviously there's things that aren't currently in our perception of being in existence, right? Mm -hmm. This is all of if we're viewing a very linear form of time, which most people experience it that way. Um, the things that are going to happen tomorrow are not yet manifest, right? Mm -hmm. They may operate on players that are manifest, but the actual events are not manifest yet. Um, and the same thing if we're playing with the idea of once upon a time there was a very small cluster of people somewhere on the planet, right? And they probably connected to a small cluster of spirits, right? Mm -hmm. And then as they spread and moved and became different cultures, those spirits changed. And there's one model that says that uh, those original spirits are kind of like the source and everything else is kind of reflections of those, right? Mm -hmm. We're seeing them under a different form to suit the new thing, but they're all the same. I don't have that experience. And I think it's much like we or any other animal kind of procreates and expands its territory. That seems to happen on the other worlds as well. Um, and so there's a lot that we can interact with that hasn't yet come about, at least as far as we can perceive it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty comfortable with the idea that we are experiencing kind of like a, a moment that is everything, right? Um, mm -hmm. this is, there's some quantum views that hold that, that uh, everything is happening simultaneously that can happen. And I'm not against that idea at all. I've, there's times that I, I'm comfortable with that. And so it's just being really open that we don't know what's there. And therefore we're not really constrained by but by what we've been informed is there mm. and that's the freedom point there it's like if we open up to the things that no one has ever written about or that we've never read about or the potential for experience that no one has had before um that's why it's the manifest and unmanifest mm. Going right back to that delightful thing you said about, you know, it seemed like a very reasonable, a very like sort of like very reasonable sort of take on the world or something like that is how you, you <laughs> describe magic. When you first, because that sounded like, and I remember going back to our last conversation, you came to that conclusion quite early on, didn't you? Quite, you were yeah. quite young when you had that sense. And do you know? was that something that you just was it experiential like this just feels right or was it more of a um you arrived there almost through a process of logic or both i think it was kind of a process of elimination um more than anything like i looked at what was going on in kind of my neighborhood and the experiences that the kids around me were having and that their parents were having and that all of us together were having and kind of in the run up to Ronald Reagan becoming elected in the US, so that time framing, um, it didn't make sense to me that the world was actually the way that it was being portrayed. Um, that didn't seem reasonable. Uh, like this really mechanistic, extractive, uh, we are the crown of creation and therefore we get to do whatever we want to this thing that was given to us, right? Um, and so I think it was initially mostly that, like, I'm not seeing that. I'm not seeing this, this storyline as being legitimate. Mm. Um, I don't see why I should want to any of the things that were put forward. The closest thing is like, yeah, maybe being like a rock star would be cool, right? Because um, <laughs> it seemed like that was the most unlike what was going on around me. Um, so later I discovered that would really not be my thing, but uh, <laughs> yeah. And so I think it was really a process of elimination initially. Like, okay, this isn't, I don't, I'm not buying this story as legit. I'm not accepting the consensual, what I you know, later discover is often termed consensual reality. I'm not accepting that as real. Mm. Um, and so I have to find an alternative explanation of what's going on. And I think we talked about it in the last podcast, but 
where that first happened, I think, is when I came across Castaneda's work in my dad's mm. little pile of paperbacks, you know, because this was this super weird world, but there was a way that it was logical to me. Like, yeah. okay, yeah, I can see how this, this makes sense in a way that this kind of story of college and marriage and kids and career and all of that really didn't make sense, mm. uh, let alone what, what we saw, what I saw going on in the world. So it was really... Yeah, I would say it was both. It's so it's yeah, it's it's process of elimination, logic, and then inspiration. Like mm. obviously when I kind of came across those things, I was like, yeah, that's that's more legit. Uh, I love that. Being yeah. Told. <laughs> yeah. What have you told? That isn't reasonable. <laughs> it's really not. I refuse. I'm not going there. Still not going there. What's um really delighted me in my more, let's say, conscious explorations into magic is how, how intelligent and logical magicians often are. And it, uh, this might sound for you, who's been so deep in this world, that might sound like a kind of, well, of course, but I think I mean, most people don't really even have a concept. There even is such a thing as a kind of real magic, you know, it's mm -hmm. kind of for all the reasons we've probably already spoken about. But I think if you're on the cusp of it, it can seem as though, well, someone's got to be a bit lacking in uh, critical thinking to be able to believe in magic. Mm -hmm. And then what I've seen over and over again is the people who are on the magical path are often the most brilliant people, which for me says something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know it's 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 an interesting one because i go both ways with that um some of my favorite magical writers are absolute madmen so i won't uh i can't suggest that to people that are starting out but uh and yet still intelligent madmen but very intelligent madmen mm. and women um yeah i think that there is there's a you've got like anything else, you've got a really wide range of people who are writing or talking on any subject, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we're in the midst of a very large kind of magical or occult boom. Yes. Um, but I'm finding this very true. I've been turned on recently to a lot of very young folks through friends who are younger than me that are on Twitter or not, or not on Twitter, who are on TikTok, who mm -hmm. are then kind of turned me on to some people. And I'm super impressed by what I'm seeing. Uh, in a lot of these folks, because I see that kind of same, I see a similar chain of logic in how they're approaching things. Mm. They're going, okay, this is a really straightforward process at its base, because it's experimental, right? And experiential. Mm. Um, you don't get to know that it works unless you do it enough mm. to find out, right? Yes. And this yeah. is true of most real skills or real crafts, mm. right? Someone can tell you, you know, I did jewelry for a long time, what that process is. And if you take your first couple of hours of trying to figure out how to saw something pretty out of a sheet of metal, you're going to go, no, it's not possible. Yes. But if you oh have gosh, the mind yeah. that says, I love that. Mm. but if you have the mind that says, okay, but is it better than it was when I first started? Right. Mm. Okay. Then you can go, okay. So I have developed skill even in the, in the, the past hour, two hours, first week, where could I take that? And to me, that's the real thing with magic is uh, if you find a simple approach is how the term that I tend to use for it, that makes sense to you on the surface that you go, okay, I don't have to believe that this is true, but I like the idea of this and the, structure of it makes sense to me on some level it's nothing that i'm going no that would never work because that's not a good place to start anything mm -hmm. um then you're really forced into this experimental and to me very logical game of you go okay if i do this particular piece of ritual for a month and i don't really change anything else in my life and my life is notably better, or I'm notably happier, or things are becoming more interesting in a way that is kind of what I'm shooting for, then that opens the door to go, okay, so what's going on? Mm. And where I can see people kind of losing the thread is, that, is if they don't ask that question. Yes. Mm. And it's not to tear it apart. It's not to break it down and go, okay, it's these three words, or it's this exact action, but to me, the question is, if I do this ritual for a month 
and my life improves. What does that mean about how I was doing things before? Mm -hmm. And what does it mean about the thing that I'm doing? And what does this suggest about the nature of my reality and my yeah. world and my experience? And I think all of the best magical practitioners, though they may not use the same language, are involved in that process mm. of going, okay, so what does this mean? And it's, again, we're not trying to understand it in the way we would understand uh, putting a car together. Yeah. Because it's not that kind of a technology, right? Um, but what does it mean about the world? Uh, and what does it mean about what's possible for me? Uh, regardless of all the things that I've been told are or are not possible for me. Yeah, I love that. I love that. I've never quite seen it from the analogy you used there about jewellery. What, what popped into my head was if you saw uh, a hunk of wood and someone said, you know, do you know what? You could actually make a beautiful table out of this. Like it would just be beyond like, like <laughs> if you hadn't seen a, a piece of wood turn into a table before, it would just be beyond any possibility of being able to imagine it. And yet, of course, it is possible, but it doesn't happen like that. It's something you would need to keep practicing and practicing, which goes back to what we were saying before we started recording about, um, it's always actually about the basics, but you, you say how you did about the idea of, uh, it's the basics for practice. Well, I think that there's this idea of, um, we were talking about kind of the idea of basic magic and advanced magic, which is a mm. very popular discussion in the magical occult world. And I don't think it's a real distinction because to me, what I've seen everywhere, and this is true in magic, is that uh, the advanced thing is the basics executed incredibly well. Mm. Um, or uh, there was, I was thinking of another friend of mine uh, who is a martial artist and he said i want to be able to move like you to my t-shirt he said excellent do exactly what you're doing for the next 15 years with me and mm -hmm. you will but i will be moving differently by that yeah point. so we're not mm -hmm. really going to sync up because it's going to be expressed differently yeah but that's the difference it's not some secret thing i'm going to teach you it's the same thing we're doing every day in class just doing it for a long time mm. I love that. Yeah, it makes so much sense. The interesting thing that occurred to me as you were saying about, you know, do something for a month and then look, you know, is my life um, noticeably better? And I suspect this is true of many people who are on the magical path in some way or other is I was thinking to myself, like, the truth is I'm usually up to quite a few things in one go. It's like I very rarely would only be doing one thing. But I was like, that doesn't matter either. I mean, just what that does that suggest about, right. you know, the nature of my reality and, you know, the what I can choose to do. Um, so I, I think that still stands, the way, that way of looking at it, albeit it's not as uh, clean and scientific. If there's just like, right, one, no. I mean, I think that's a worthwhile practice too, though, to perhaps like not do anything but one thing for a month, maybe. And I've, and I've done both. I tend to do quite a bit uh, altogether, but it's kind of like, it, for me, what ends up is being like, there's a series of things that I do. I eat a particular way because I feel better. Mm. Um, I have not tried to make this perfect. Uh, but there's things that I know that if I eat them regularly, I'll begin to notice the change, right? Mm. I don't do well with uh, gluten and uh, that stuff. Um, but I can eat it. I'm not a celiac, so it doesn't make me immediately sick. But if I have it regularly, I can see that there's a downgrade in how I feel, right? Yeah. Um, and the same is true with like walking or exercising, right? There's a certain amount that I should move or I don't feel very good. Mm -hmm. I don't have to nail it all the way down and go, okay, we're kind of also, this is one of those funny internet worlds of like optimization and let's perfect yeah. it. It's like, mm -hmm. is it, I need to walk for 22 minutes at a particular heart rate. It's like, yeah, not really. You, you could go there, but unless you're trying to really uh, seek a very, very specific result, you don't have to do it that way. And so there's definitely magical practices, if we look historically, that are uh, kind of all-consuming. And I, you also see this in, in meditative practices and different things, uh, because they're trying to produce a very specific result. 
Mm. But in general, you don't have to go that route. Um, and for most people, I don't, it's like anything else. Most of us don't need to be specialists in very many things. Yeah. Talking about meditation, actually, um, I had a, I wouldn't even call it a love-hate relationship with meditation. Actually, let's call it just pure hate. <laughs> it was me and meditation for many years. And I've now, um, I've now created a meditation practice purely um, because I can see how it will benefit me in terms of magic, in terms mm -hmm. of... Uh, all sorts of things, uh, including that focus and um, just notice. I used to think, I, <laughs> it's quite embarrassing looking back, I used to think, well, I don't need it because I can focus and have a clear mind so well. I don't need meditation, but it was so interesting in the practice of meditation, realizing like how not true that actually was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the thing, right? <laughs> um, I'd love your view on this. And it's interesting because I've, I've recently heard a number of magicians say if they only had to do one practice, they only could do one practice, it would be meditation. So I'd love your thoughts on that. I am uh, firmly in the camp that meditation was horribly painful for a really long time. Um, and I was really pleased to, to see, uh, <laughs> there's a, she's passed, I believe, but a Buddhist nun named Ayakema. And in one of her books, she talks about this and she says, yeah, who told you it was supposed to not be unpleasant? <laughs> uh, cause that's not my take. <laughs> she was, and she was like, it's, it's teaching you kind of how to pers persevere through these moments of, mm unpleasantness or difficulty is a part of the initial state. And yeah, you do generally move beyond that, but I still have times that if I set the clock and I'm going to sit for 45 minutes every day for, you know, the next month, half of those days, I'm not really going to like, um, mm. so I don't tend to do it that way anymore, but I do find that it's really necessary for me to just sit and go, what's going on in my head. Mm. And that's the basic form of meditation. I think it's, it's people believe you're, there's this, there's this weird view that came out of, I don't know, probably that old television show Kung Fu with David Carradine or something, um, where meditation is this connecting to this kind of inner silence and peace state, right? And this is more appropriately probably thought of as uh, concentration in a, mm. versus meditation itself, um, or at least that's how I would think about it right now. And meditation is really just like if you sit down and agree to kind of do very, very little um, and just track something simple like your breath or your heartbeat, something like that. Part of what happens is your mind starts to rebel, right? And this is why it's unpleasant. And it's like, no, 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 we want to do something else. We want to do all sorts of other things. That right there is the whole point, mm. is to let you see that rebellion happening. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not about the peace that comes from it. It's about, you go, okay, I get to see my own constant chatter. I get to hear the narratives, uh, which is, you know, was a huge thing for me is the narrative yeah. aspect of all this stuff. And so that to me is the beauty of meditation. There's lots of ways you can do things that make it easier. Like if you do pranayama or breath work of any kind before you meditate, that helps. Mm -hmm. um, I do light trance inductions if I haven't been meditating and it's really uncomfortable before I start and then I'll meditate. Um, but mostly it's just about it not having the expectation of something in particular. To me, meditation is 90% is of its benefit is just about seeing what's going on in your own head, mm. which is the unpleasant part of it. And so that's, <laughs> that is the goal. You're, you're doing it right. If it sucks, you're doing it right. Um, and uh, it changes over time. And that's the other piece of it. That, uh, it's not like you then are going to go into some uh, wildly different state necessarily initially. But over time you go, oh, I just watched all that chatter without it irritating me. Mm. Or if we're doing kind of a more inside approach you, where you're kind of labeling the things that arise, going, okay, I'm, I'm in my memories. I'm in mm. my emotions. I'm projecting into the future. You start doing that and you go, oh, wait a second, how much time do I spend kind of living inside my memories? How much time do I spend kind of controlled entirely by my emotions? How much time do I spend projecting into the future? And how much time do I spend just being right where I am? Um, I think it's hugely helpful. Um, 
there has been a number of folks uh, in recent years talking about how meditation is not the best thing for some folks. Um, this has kind of, I think, arisen with a lot of the in general increase in kind of anxiety. Um, I think it would be qual probably qualified as a disorder, so I don't really like that term. Um, and I'm not really qualified to speak to that because I've never had that experience. But I do know that there are some folks that uh, if you're really getting messed up by it, you might want to look at and see if you can find somebody that can help you get to the root mm. cause of that before you try and force it too hard. But know that it's unpleasant and know that you're going to just be chattering uh, for most people when you start. Mm. Yeah, that really makes sense. So, um, yeah, I was kind of thinking you'd probably have that sense of, yeah, it is, you know, it's part of the path is, you know, having a meditation practice of some kind. So, yeah, I was, I would have been surprised, I think, if you hadn't said that. And I, and I would say that for most folks, um, if it doesn't go easily, just go to a breathwork practice first mm -hmm. um, and play with that. Work on something like face breathing or... Uh, box breathing. There's all sorts of mm -hmm. different breathing techniques you yeah. can do that produce different effects. And start there first. You don't have to start with trying to just sit and <laughs> watch your breath. Um, and that's often very, very hard for us now. And I think it's harder and harder the more kind of digital and distraction based yeah. uh, yes. our world gets. Yeah. So if it seems like if you're reading books from the 70s and it seems like these people had an easier time doing it than you do, they probably did. Yeah, yeah, really well said. Yes, and we probably could do with it more. Now and we probably we need it yeah. more than they did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very true. So for listeners who, this is perhaps their one of their first introductions into the idea of consciously choosing to practice magic, where would you suggest they start? Um... My friend Meredith Graves said something um, in an interview, I believe, on Glitch Bottle that I, has stuck with me really well. And this is not what I would have said previously, but I really think she's right. Um, and what she said was, this is my paraphrasing and I'm probably butchering it, but uh, she said, the first place to start is to think about what you think magic is. Mm -hmm. What does it look like to you? What does it feel like to you? What does it sound like to you? This is me extrapolating from there. Um, does this look like witchcraft in a movie? Does this look like ceremonial magic with someone in a circle? Does this look like shamanism? Does this look like some kind of, uh, you know, uh, Norse or, or European pagan kind of, uh, kind of root sorcery practice? Does this look like hoodoo or voodoo? because that tells you quite a bit about where your mind is about it to begin mm. and see what kind of keys are in there. Um, and so to me, if you hold that as your first kind of step, so you go, I okay, what do I already think it is? Mm -hmm. And you're not looking to prove or to disprove. You're just being aware of that. That can help you shape it and how you shape your practice. So for me, I kind of forced myself into a ceremonial magical role that never fit. Um, for a number was of Was that years. because at the time that just seemed like that was the magical, like there was only one Where I was, yeah. Was Where I was, it was uh, either that or uh, kind of um, mostly kind of Starhawk-based feminist Wicca, mm -hmm. which I really mm -hmm. liked. Um, that was one of my earliest influences, but uh, I couldn't find anybody outside of the ceremonial world that was really talking about kind of the structure and logic. Mm -hmm. And I had that sense, like, okay, yeah. I want to understand. And I'm also not really devotionally driven, um, mm -hmm. which a lot of the witchcraft is. Yeah. Um, or the, especially the Wicca in particular is, um, which I think is a beautiful thing. I just don't have it anymore than I don't have what it would take to be a Christian. Um, I don't have that impulse. Um, and so ceremonial is what I found, but the rigidity of it really mm. didn't work for me. And so it was helpful in a way because it gave me a set of constraints to go, what don't I like about this? Mm. Like what, yes, it can what, be so helpful. Yeah. What part of this ritual doesn't work? 
And what happens mm -hmm. if I change it, even though everybody says you shouldn't? Mm -hmm. um, so if I don't like those, that language, or if I don't like that geometrical form, or I don't like the fact that I'm supposed to command something to do with something, what if I change those squares into circles? And what if I ask things to help me instead, mm -hmm. right? All of that mm -hmm. was really beneficial coming from there. But so I would say first is like, yeah, kind of see if you already have an aesthetic or a sense of it. What, what mm. when you see it in a movie or you read it in a book, feels really good to you. Yeah. And kind of bring that to your practice because that'll make it easier. Um, and it might be something, whether that's a historical memory or, you know, with, depending on your take on past lives or genetic memory, if, depending on what you think about kind of that kind of memory. Um, it gives you a, 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 an easier in, I think, if you play with that. Mm. And then the second can thing I just is jump, just, can I just, yeah. I, I would love to say something about that because yeah. I think that's such a, I wasn't expecting you to say that at all. And I love that. Um, I notice the work that I do with people, we are often talking about archetypes and a lot of them are with the idea there's a kind of mar uh, uh, an archetype that's kind of calling them in some way or is there mm -hmm. as an ally there to be like almost like bring down their power and embody that and you know allow that to um manifest in their life in some way and it's really fascinating noticing with the what i might call the magical archetypes like priestess witch those sorceress all those kinds of things people do have a really clear sense that it, for me it's not witch but it is priestess or whatever there's a real sense that they have and it's not necessarily anti any of them but there's a clear sense that there's a as a feeling an experience that one of those magical archetypes has for them which others don't and that, I, again, I don't know why that is. Like you said, it could be their soul chose that. It could be a past life. I don't know. But I, what you've said, I seem to be true over and over again. People do have a sense of it. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, uh, I never connected with the kind of title of witch. And I kind of fought against magician for a long time. And then I started using variations on sorcerer because at the time I was doing this, this was not a really used term. Mm -hmm. um, in the magical community. So it was really neutral. And by that same thing, it's interesting because I have kind of a, again, we could say, I guess, archetypal or kind of structural connection is how I would think of it to kind of Nordic, Germanic, Anglo-Saxon views of things. Um, mm, yes, you do. But, yeah. I'm, mm. but I'm not at all religious within that, but mm. I can see ways in which kind of uh, that I can connect to powers that are clearly uh, Woden related mm. or have a deep connection to the concept of the Norns, right? Um, and as soon as I kind of got comfortable and went like, J that's just it. It's like, which is kind of problematic right now because we have so much of this stuff has been co-opted by the kind of uh, more fascistic sides of the right and white power movements. So it's not the thing I would choose, right? If I was just mm -hmm. going to go, I would like to not, it would be easier in some ways to not have that because then mm -hmm. no one would be confused, right? Um, but that is the thing that makes sense. That's the mm -hmm. language that makes sense. And so if I work within that, everything works better. Um, yeah. Mm. And I don't know what that is. Uh, Oh, I love yeah. that. Mm. I was just thinking similarly, because it would be so much easier, wouldn't it, if you could choose, but we don't seem to. I was just thinking. <laughs> my heritage, in fact, literally, my, I've uh, had a, my DNA uh, analyzed, whatever you want to call it. And my heritage is like something crazy, like 99% Northern European, and it's mostly Britain. And then I've got 1%. So for me, it would make total sense to be go down that tradition no, I'm so strongly drawn to shamanism. And I've got 1% of my DNA that's Siberian. And so I'm like, I wonder if that's to blame. <laughs> well, there's some really interesting stuff. There's um, a book called uh, Seed of Yggdrasil that I'm working through right now by Maria. And I don't know how you say her name, but Kvilau maybe. And she's really looking at the idea that... Uh, 
a lot of the northern myths and things are really descriptions of what I would refer to as older shamanic rituals. Mm. Um, is part of the thing that she covers. And I believe that that's what you find, like a lot of the stuff that we see as kind of modern Norse re reconstruction stuff is tied into this very singular period of about a thousand years of data that we have. But <laughs> we talked about this before, my sense of time goes really far back. So mm -hmm. we know that if we look at that Siberian side, that's not necessarily all that different from what we see in the kind of Sami uh, shamanic traditions and all mm. of that other stuff. So did all that stuff look way more like shamanism? I think it did. Mm. Uh, and so I'm, it's, it's kind of funny. So it's like, I'll, I'll have people periodically want to fight with me about my use of Northern stuff and go like, this is not what's in the edits. And it's like, I don't care. It's mm. like, uh, that was a jumping off point, and I still refer to that yeah. stuff. But there's a point where you have connection, and then I trust the connection. Um, I'm aware that what's come down to us is very fragmented, heavily mm. Christianized, um, uh, heavily redacted, and just mass quantities of it are lost. So I'm going to trust the connection more than I am the, yeah. the academia yes. around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. I love that. I also love your invitation to... I guess just not feel that you have to adopt fully one frame. And it, that's how I very much feel. Although um, I'm training in shamanism, I don't know I'll ever actually refer to myself as a shaman. It doesn't feel like something necessarily. I mean, it, it, it would be convenient, but it actually doesn't feel like it's a name that I kind of actually want to, or identity mm -hmm. that I want to adopt. So I really get that, you know, that kind of you exploring like a magician, sorcerer, what is it? And I think that's a really helpful approach for many too, that we don't need to kind of say, okay, lock, stock and barrel, this is the tradition. And this means I have to also refer to myself with this identity. Yeah. And it's, again, it's, it's, it's an interesting practice that we as people do outside of magic, right? Is, in a lot of cases, we're going to identify with some group, with some approach, right? Whether that be political, whether that be sports teams, whether that be, you know, we define ourselves by all of mm -hmm. these things. And those are, to me, uh, they're not entirely negative because they can make things easier, right? It mm -hmm. gives you a short form. It gives you like a shorthand. Mm -hmm. If you see somebody that's wearing your team's colors, basically, basically, right? Mm -hmm. You have something in common with that person, right? Yeah. But it doesn't tell you much else, right? Mm -hmm. And so it really doesn't tell you the whole story. And so it's a very, uh, it's an interesting thing. I'm really pleased that my work at least seems to have really reached across a lot of different communities within the magical community. Because a lot mm. of the times they do kind of shut her down and go, okay, I'm just studying this one piece. Which, and again, there's nothing wrong with that if it works for you. But the thing that can be problematic is if people looking at it from the outside go, oh, I have to do that. I yeah. have to determine that I am a witch and what kind mm -hmm. of witch I am. Or I am a magician or I am a thelemite or I am a, you know. And you don't have to do that. Um, identity magic in itself is a really fascinating concept uh, that kind of speaks against that to some degree. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, Who we think mm -hmm. we are matters. Yeah. And it's one of the base level things we can change. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Which goes right back to our last conversation about rewilding. Yeah. Coming off yeah. the tracks. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And going back to the impact of your work, I think your, your openness, I'm sure, is a, a kind of invitation for other people who, um, not everyone is ready to have that kind of like open way of seeing things and being relationship things. So I think, you know, the people who are ready for that are kind of loving what you're bringing because it, it is, yeah, by its very nature creates that invitation for more and more openness, which I think is exactly what's needed. So I interrupted you a few, 10 minutes or so ago. And you a while ago. To point two. Can you remember what point two was? <laughs> oh, well, we were talking about how someone might get started. So, mm. The first thing I would say is, yeah, see what it seems like to you. If you were to be the kind of person who would do these kinds of things, what would you be like? And this is a great question to keep in mind forever. Um, and then it's really about finding, to me, my approach is, is, I, 
it's, it's very incremental. Um, there's a lot of folks that will say you need to study everything under the sun so that you have a thorough grasp of the entire whatever. And uh, I'm not that guy. Uh, my suggestion is that you find one or two practices. It could be three or four, whatever, that are interesting to you and that it is suggested would be beneficial in a way that you think you could use. And just start with those. And you can also read and do all that stuff if you want to, but you don't have to. Um, and then go, go through that process of watching, see what happens. How does it make you feel when you do it? Mm. Is there anything that is hard for you? Like if you're using one of my books and I've got language in there that might be necessary or might be part of the ritual. Is there anything in the language that I use that doesn't sit right with you? If so, Run with it for a little bit so you get a sense of what it feels with that in it, and then start changing that language and seeing if you can go, well, what is he suggesting? What, is he, what, what's he, what do I think he's talking about here? Mm. Is there a way I could say this that speaks more wholly to who I am in my experience? Because my language is not everybody's language. Um, and rather than going hunting for more and more practices, Bring that approach to the few that you've picked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And go, okay, this is a simple candle spell to bring more joy into my life. Mm -hmm. Right? Something like that. Um, it could be a, a very, very simple thing like that. How could that also be used to bring more uh, wealth into your life? How could that framework or approach is kind of the term that I use for it, be used to improve the situation in your neighborhood? How could it be used to change the world situation? Does the actual framework have to change? Or is it you 10 minutes, a candle and you know, some mm. herbs or some water or some oil, whatever you do? Is that enough to do most of the things that you want to do? And if it isn't, then go looking. But determine that it isn't first. Like, don't go complex mm. first. Go complex as kind of not last result, but learn what that tool does. It would be like, again, if we go back to the making the table, you go, okay, there's, you've, you've got saws, you've got chisels, you've got a lathe. You don't necessarily need different tools to make a guitar. Mm. Mm. Or you might just need a couple of different tools. Yeah. Right? Oh, I love that. You might need mm -hmm. some jigs for, mm -hmm. your, for your table saw uh, so that you can put the frets in them. Um, and with that kind of, if you have a few kind of approaches that work for you, then really see where can I bring these to bear on my situation? Where can mm -hmm. I bring these to bear on the world situation? Where can I bring these to bear on my connection to the field or to the allies or to, uh, you know, uh, archetypal powers that I know or I think might be beneficial to me. Um, that to me is kind of the root approach uh, into all of this stuff. Uh, and unfortunately, I think most people go in too many directions too soon. Mm. And that can kind of lead to... Uh, more problems than it solves yeah that really makes sense yeah i love everything you've just said and i was thinking again this is where your invitation to openness i think is so so valuable um i was just thinking about how i have written a hyper sigil for quite some time i can't really remember how long and when I read Weaving Fate, which is uh, at least half it is about uh, what you call the black book, um, I adopted some of the ways that you described that I suddenly realized, oh, I can really feel there's some power in doing it this way instead of the way I have been doing it. Um, 
And yet I didn't wholeheartedly like adopt what you'd suggested mm-hmm. because I was happy with some of the other ways that I was doing it. And I kind of always felt like the invitation was there, even though you were saying like, this is the way it always felt like just again, the way that you are, it felt like the invitation was there. Not that I need it necessarily, but it's still lovely to have that, you know, like it's okay to make this my own and make it work in whatever way is going to fit with me. And, uh, Again, is it's hard to be scientific about these things for all the reasons we've said, but it definitely, firstly, going back to what you've said, the experience of writing it feels so much more um, meaningful and engrossing and enjoyable. My senses, it's it's having um, a positive impact. Like I can, I feel as though it has, again, it's very hard to know for sure. So that's a, I think a great example where we don't have to take some, someone else's way of doing something like lock, stock and barrel. I think just again, feeling, trusting yourself, like feeling into, and sometimes that will mean like adopting it wholeheartedly to start with. But again, Mm -hmm. in that instance, I already had a practice, which I then kind of like melded. Um, Yeah. I wonder if that's, um, we're almost out of time. And don't, don't feel we have to go there towards the uh, Black Book idea, but would you mind either sharing more about that or something else that might be just like a, a lovely place for people to start as a kind of like first practice? Yeah, I, I would suggest um, the thing that opens things up the most for me and for most of the people that I know is a simple offering practice. Um, and I talk about this in six ways, but you do not need the book to do this because it's so simple. <laughs> um, and for me, all that is, is that on a fairly regular basis, I offer a candle, uh, sometimes some incense, um, cool water all the time, and often some food or some candy or if I have coffee or something to my allies. Um, and I did this before I was had any real solid connection to my allies. And it's one of the things that really built it up. And the way that I do this is I like, it's a five minute process. It's not an involved thing. It's like uh, the room that we're in, it used to be my jewelry shop. And so it's where I do all of that work. Um, And uh, so I would like walk in, I've got a, you know, fireproof bowl with fireproof candle holder in it. So I don't start a fire. Uh, (laughs) I light the candle. I light the incense. And I just say, you know, I, I give this offering to my allies those who aid and guard me, uh, who watch over me, who assist me, uh, may there be peace between us all days. Um, the language doesn't super matter, except I do really like getting specific about who it's for. Mm. You want to feed the things that help you. Yes. And there's things around you that don't necessarily help you. So that's that I do find that having something that is, this is where the, those who aid and guard me that's the piece that never changes for me. Mm. Um, yeah, it's quite hard to, for anyone to kind of twist that to mean something other than. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a little tricky. Um, and that, to me, does this. Uh, there's a, a whole class of magic that I think fits in here. But my experience of that is what I refer to as greasing the wheels. Like everything works better. Yeah. And that's kind of the beauty of that practice. Is it's like the it's kind of keys you into. There's stuff I could do that makes everything work better. It's not specific. It's not me trying to generate the specific result. Mm. Uh, but what are the things that just make my life work better initially? And um, from there, say you do that, you know, half of the days of the week uh, for a month or two. Then once you have a sense of that you, and my suggestion is do that and then sit for a few minutes with it, just to see, to say, do you get any ideas? Does anything pop into your head? Um, you know, some folks see things, some folks hear voices, depends on who you are, uh, and see if you get feedback from it. Mm. Do that for again, a month or two. And once you feel like you have a connection going, and this is gonna be again, different for everybody, but once you have a sense that when you do this, you can feel the change in the room, you can feel the change in yourself, um, go ahead and do that thing. Sit down, be quiet for a few minutes, and then ask specifically for help for what's going on in your life from your allies. Um, 
and this is again, this is extremely plain spoken in my case, go in and go, I'm really stressed. I have trying to sell the house, whatever, trying to get a new job. My new boss sucks, whatever. Uh, can you help me or can you show me a path to something better mm. in this situation? And then again, sit with that um, and see what comes. And usually in magic things, there are folks who are, who I call like the kind of on command, easy hallucinators. Uh, that their allies are just right there and they'll go, well, here's what you do. You need to go over here and talk to this guy. It's not how it works for most people. Um, so what you want to do is become aware of new ideas coming to you or new thoughts. Mm. Or if you have an impulse in a different direction that's not a negative one, um, try it and see what happens because that's usually what happens for most of the folks that I know, and it's certainly for me. So if I did that thing and maybe I brought that to the table for a week uh, with, along with the offerings, um, most commonly what happens is I'll either wake up with a really clear idea of what to do different, or if there's been difficulty with someone, I've had this be to the degree where somebody has gone, look, when you started working this job, I really didn't like you. And so I know I was kind of, you know, a bastard to you, <laughs> but hopefully, you know, I realize now we kind of run on different tracks, but you're good. And I, sorry, that has actually happened to me. Wow. Um, <laughs> I've also had the guy that I had issues with and didn't think anybody else had issues that like the layer of like sexual harassment complaints that had been going on for years, somebody finally comes into the HR department that goes, this guy can't be here. <laughs> and they're gone, right? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I've had both of these things happen. Um, I've also had really clear instructions uh, where I'll like, usually it's when I'm waking up or I'll wake up in the middle of the night. And it's like, I have the clear idea of, okay, I could go and write this sentence out on a piece of paper and uh, bury it down by the train tracks uh, and give an offering of some wine and that would resolve the situation. Mm. And I've had that work. Um, and so it's really, again, it's, it's, this is a process of communication. Again, if we come back to that idea of falling in love with the field of the inhabitants is we have to be paying attention to them. Mm -hmm. um, and the falling in love part I talk about in six ways is a really useful way to approach kind of magical work, which is, can you find that state that is like when you are falling in love with someone or that mm -hmm. thing, you can't take your eyes off of them. Um, you, there's just this whole vibration that you get when you think about them, when you're with them, whether or not ever, anything ever comes about from it, right? That's a separate thing. That level of kind of uh, immersive connection is the thing that matters in the way that I work and yeah. the way that the, the books mm -hmm. that I have written work are kind of reliant on that rather than some magical formula. There's oh, no magical yeah. formula mm -hmm. uh, in what I do. And so, yeah, it's, it's open that connection to the allies and build the relationship. Realize that the other thing that we say a lot among some friends of mine is, if you think about your friends that you really like and who are there for you all the time and who call you up and go, I have to move. Would you help me move? And there's people that you're gonna, you're gonna go, I don't wanna do that, right? And you're gonna come up with mm -hmm. a reason why you can't. And there's people that you're gonna go, Oh, hell yeah. No problem. I will rearrange yeah. my weekend mm -hmm. and we'll get you out of there and into your new place. Right. We want to be that person that the allies want to help, which yeah. is a reciprocal relationship. So we have to first make the connection. And this is again, one of the things that can be hard for people in magic. Cause a lot of the books are like, this is the sigil of the spirit and you're mm -hmm. going to compel it to do something. Mm. And I've always been like, Okay, but why is that the relationship you want? What if yeah. there's some spirit you've never met that is mm -hmm. dying to do that thing for you? 
Yeah. And I think I want to work with that one. Yeah. If you're someone who is drawn to be wild and free, why would you want to compel or trap or bind any other being? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And there is a place for that, but it is in places where it's, uh, where there's, I th- to me, that's kind of means of last resorts when when mm. when a particular being has uh, gone out of hand, because I've come across things that are essentially like spirits that have, in my kind of sense of them, that have been driven crazy. Mm. Um, that, but usually that's because they were bound somewhere; they became stuck mm. somewhere. And so usually the the result is first like, do you want to stay here? Because mm-hmm. we could maybe help you get out of here. Yeah. Or are you really just here to mess with people? In which case, since it's my backyard, you're going to have to go. <laughs> but uh, you know, that's a very different thing than doing that as kind of your, your, your baseline yeah. approach. Definitely. Oh, my goodness. This has been such uh, another just gorgeous conversation that I could quite happily just carry on and on and on. But we need <laughs> to uh, draw it to a close. Um, mm. I feel like I'm just tempted. I just want to get one more, one more little bit out of you. <laughs> um, is this anything you would like to leave listeners with in terms of, um, it could be a piece of advice or some words of wisdom, just something you feel would be helpful for listeners to know? A lot of my work for the last couple of years in specific, but really for about the last decade has been playing with the idea, which I know we talked about before, but I'll hit it again which is that we are a narrative-driven species. Um, and I know that I ended the last, uh, the last one a little bit on the doomy side, and I realized, <laughs> yes, afterwards, yes. <laughs> and I realized afterwards that I would like to add to that. That's um, okay, I've got enough rose-tinted glasses for everyone. <laughs> yeah, no, it's perfect. But it, and what I mean when I see that, I, you know, it's like I do clearly see a trajectory that we're currently on, right? And I'm not a fan of it. My approach to dealing with this is to really work to generate narratives that if they were the guiding narrative for folks overall in some version, we wouldn't be on this path. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a question of very radical change. Um, but that happens through narrative. And we're in this because of the nature of the digital world, the media-driven world, the social media-driven world, and all the craziness we're seeing happen with there. Take control of your personal narrative is my primary thing. What you say to yourself about yourself, uh, get a handle on that. And make sure it's Mm. the life that you want to live. Because it most likely will be the life that you do live. And this is not the secret. This is not if you can visualize it hard enough, you're going to get it. But if you can't visualize it at all, you probably won't. Yes. Mm. And story is, I think, everything for humans. So try and figure out how do you make the story uh, a better one. Mm. And this is really the focus of my second book, right? Is that's really yes. what that is. Yeah. Um, and uh, the more time in I spend with that idea, the more that's kind of the critical component, I think, for mm. to me for where we're now. It's not enough to resist the things we don't like. We have to actually be kind of clearly, at least on the inside, living in a, in a very different place that allows us to have the kind of world we think that should be. Oh, gosh. Honestly, we could do a whole show about this now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really couldn't agree more. We're just um, in the midst of running our Waking the Wild Medicine Circle, our, our program. And um, the uh, this month, the theme is all around story, which basically exactly what you've just said there. So, yeah, mm-hmm. I, I think such, such, I mean... Talk about magic, it really, you know, that again, so foundational really, isn't it? I think it all comes from, if we're trying to build things on top, you know, do practices, magical practices of any kind without addressing that deeper layer of kind of, what is that story we're telling about ourselves and the world? I I don't think that's going to create very much that's going to serve without addressing that stuff first. Absolutely. Mm. And I think it's interesting. It's the use to me of, kind of the idea of personal mythology 
Mm, right? Yes. Like look really closely at what your personal mythology really is, not what you want it to be. Mm. Uh, and see if that needs to change. Because a lot of yes. us would like to say that we have this very expansive, very uh, positive thing, but inside we're all kind of terror and fear, right? Mm. You, you're going to have to deal with that side to do the other one, but you also yes. have to really see the other one and you can't turn away from any of it either. You know, the, the traditional shadow work is absolutely necessary. Definitely, definitely. Do you know what? I think we've got another a third episode. In this <laughs> episode. <laughs> I'm always happy to chat with you. It's a great pleasure. So. I, think we, I think we've definitely got another one in us. Um, thank you so much. I'm sure we ended last time with me asking you to share where people can find out all about you and your stuff. But would you mind doing that again, like your books and everything? Yep. Where, where can they find um, out about that? Everything is available through AidenWalker.com. Uh, my books are available primarily uh, only through online resellers, but pretty much everywhere. Um, Weaving Faith, the new one, is also available as an ebook. And my next kind of project, once I get through a couple that I'm stuck in and have been for about six months, is to get Six Ways out as an ebook as well. But uh, AidenWalker.com will get you to everything. I've been kind of backing further and further away from social media. Uh, for the last few months. So uh, I'm there, but I'm not as active. Mm, wonderful. Thank you so much, Aidan. This has just been another delight. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Leah. Wow. What a fabulous show. I adore Aidan's philosophy. Here are my takeaways. I love Aidan's view that magic is the relationship we have with the field, manifest and unmanifest reality. Don't feel you have to adopt a whole magical tradition, lock, stock and barrel. See what magic means to you and what you're drawn to. Start with a few simple practices and then adjust and play with different intentions. And you can start with a simple offering ritual. Offer food, water or incense to your allies, speak out your intention. And after you've created a relationship, only then ask for the help and see what happens. If you'd like to get the notes and links for everything we spoke about this week, hop on over to the show notes at primalhappiness.co slash episode 323. And if you are feeling the call to either Wake the World Masculine or Wake the World Feminine, go along to primalhappiness.co slash WTWF for Waking the World Feminine, which is open for enrollment right now or primalhappiness.co slash WTWM for Wake Up Masculine, which will be opening for enrollment soon. You can right now register your interest to be the first to know when it opens for enrollment. And if you don't want to miss out next week's episode, head on over to Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, or your Android or iOS app of choice and hit that subscribe button. That way you'll get each episode delivered straight to your device as soon as it's released. Thank you so much for listening. You've been wonderful. Catch you again next Tuesday.